Thanks for joining us. This is a continuing series of lessons on the Messianic prophecies. These are prophecies in the Old Testament Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures, concerning the Messiah, the Anointed, Jesus, the Christ of God. And all of the fulfillment of all of the prophecies and God's promises that He made in the Old Testament came to us in Jesus. What we believe about God and the Scriptures are important. From the beginning of this study, the basis of this study has been that we believe what the Bible claims about itself. And what the Bible says about itself is that it is a unified story. A story made over hundreds of years, in fact, 1,500 years, told by many different people. But it's the same storyteller. God inspired the holy men. He inspired Moses and David and all the others who wrote in the ancient Near East about the Messiah and about the state of Israel. We have traveled now through eight weeks of study. We have traveled starting first in the Garden of Eden and then through Abraham and David in the last two sessions with Isaiah chapter 53 talking about and contemplating this grand tapestry, this great picture of the love and the grace of God and His willingness to love us and forgive us and to save us from our sins, despite awful, awful examples of sin and sinfulness, even among people who believe in God and the Scriptures. This study, if we plumb the depths of it, it would be a lifelong study. We're only hitting the tips of the iceberg, if you will. We're only dancing across the top of the information. One of the core passages of Scripture that we have read and considered from the beginning are three verses after Jesus has been resurrected and Him talking to two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. And them not knowing that it's Jesus, Jesus says to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into His glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the, all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What Jesus is telling these two, and what we begin to understand, and what they had failed to understand up to this point, is the scriptures talk about a suffering Messiah. While yes, he is king, and yes, he is Lord and Savior, he would also suffer and die. And that's not something that the, the Israelites of Jesus' day believed. When Jesus was born, there was an expectation. There was an expectation of the fulfillment of all of the prophecies that they knew about in the past. This is the ninth in our series of lessons. And what we're going to try to accomplish in this session is a short run-through of the fulfillment of Messianic prophecies in the Gospel of Matthew. There was an expectation growing among the Jews at Jesus' time, and in fact, even before they were hoping for and longing for a Messiah, longing for the Christ. For 800 years before Christ, Israel had suffered as a race and as a nation. Some of the lows and some of the judgments of God were awful, and some of the evil men, what they practiced and what they did to Jews was horrific. For 800 years, Jews had suffered at the hands of the Assyrian Empire. We can read about these in the Old Testament even suffered at the hands of the Egyptian empire, and this is even after the exodus. Suffered at the hands of the Babylonians and the Medo-Persian empire. Suffered at the hands of the Greeks. This was the empire right before our Lord came. And then closer to the time our Lord came, the Roman empire. Now, if you followed through in those maps, you saw that Israel was a very small portion of all of that. But for our time and for our focus, it's a very important place. It's a very important time to understand during this time because some of the suffering was according to the prophets. Some of the suffering was fulfilling prophecies. Some prophecies about judgment and their rebellion dating all the way back to Moses in Deuteronomy. Much of their suffering and much of the judgment that God sent on them was due to their idolatry and rebellion. But all the while, there are remnant passages and Messiah passages and kingdom passages 
spoken of in grand and glorious ways. And these were the sorts of things that the Jews of Jesus' day were holding on to, looking forward. Some of the suffering happened because there were evil men. Evil men who, even while the Hebrews were trying to follow God, some of the leaders of these nations controlling the area were just wicked, wicked people. Adding to all of this, here comes this expectation, an expectation of the Messiah. Even though our God had prophesied in Amos chapter 8 about a famine, a famine for the word. There had been no verifiable prophet in Israel for a long time, and along comes our Matthew, in comes Matthew and the gospel. The time of the, of the occurrence of Jesus is around 30 A.D. And Matthew is a gospel, it's a book, a sermon, a treatise written by a Jew to Jews. It was written about the fulfillment of Jewish scripture. And it was written about 20 to 25 years after Jesus lived. It's written to get them to try to understand and see that Jesus really was the Messiah. Add it even before the time of Jesus' birth, even to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, there was a heightened expectation about the Messiah that led to many false claims and false teachers. And Jesus even warned about that himself in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11. And he told his disciples, don't run off thinking that I'm in the desert or thinking that I'm somewhere else. There are going to be false teachers and false Christs and false claims. Even in Acts chapter 5. The Sanhedrin is in deliberation about how to handle the apostles and their teaching about Jesus as being the Christ. And at that time, they spoke of two examples of men who even preceded Jesus, who were leaders, who carried people away. And the following of those two men ended at nothing. Now what's interesting about Matthew's gospel, modern historians have an aloofness about them, almost a detachment. But with Matthew, he knows and has seen what he's writing about. He was an eyewitness. And his purpose is to help all who will read to believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Messiah scriptures and prophecies. God had promised Israel a deliverer. God had promised Israel a new kingdom and a new law. And what Jesus did when he comes is he fulfills this. We're going to look at scriptures as we move through. Before we get to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew begins his gospel in Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 through 16 with a powerhouse of information of a Jewish genealogy. He begins the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And in beginning at that passage, we need to understand a few things. First, Christ is not Jesus' last name. My name is Mark Russell. Jesus Christ, Christ, the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, is who Jesus is. It's not a name. It's more of a title. We have become accustomed to calling Him the Christ. But what Matt, when Matthew calls Him Jesus Christ, there are times that I add a definite article sometimes when I read this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And this is a very Jewish way of starting. In fact, at Genesis, if you, you could outline Genesis, when it talks about the generations or the genealogies of different people, you can go through and do a computer search through even the book of Genesis this way. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Matthew says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord God had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Matthew chapter 1, he's dealing with the virgin birth. Now, if you go back and study Isaiah chapter 7, it's not necessarily talking about a virgin birth, but God was going to save the people. And by the time a young maiden had had a child, Israel would be saved. In Matthew chapter 1, we see the more grand fulfillment that it was actually someone who was a virgin, not just a maiden, but a virgin. And she conceived by the Holy Spirit and bore a son according to God's plan. Later in the early birth narratives in Matthew chapter 2 and in verse 15, it says, 
and they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now normally a reading of Hosea chapter 11, that doesn't seem very messianic. But notice here that Matthew, inspired by God, makes a connection here. He makes a connection here to salvation. And it makes a connection with out of Egypt, which was a theme throughout the Old Testament scriptures. And just two verses later in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. A quotation from Jeremiah chapter 31. This is in reference to the travesty, to the despicable act of Herod coming and killing the children who would have been the same age as the baby Jesus. A few verses later in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23, have you, have you noticed we're not even out of chapter 2 yet? And here we see many references that Matthew is using. Matthew 2 and 23, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. From Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. Now, this is an occasion after Joseph and Mary have come back out of Egypt, and they don't go back to Bethlehem where Jesus was born, but they go back to Nazareth where we find Jesus growing up the rest of his life. In Matthew chapter 3 and in verse 3, For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3 talked about the coming of the one who would precede the Christ. This, of course, is talking about John the Baptist. And here, in just these first three chapters of the book of Matthew, we see time and again, Matthew is telling the people who will read it, look, what Jesus is, Jesus is not against your scriptures. He's actually fulfilling your scriptures, which was an important idea that Matthew was trying to get across to the people who were reading his gospel. Now, in the, in the, the temptation scene in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy three times. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13. And he says, it is written. Jesus was a man who believed in the Old Testament scriptures. Now, that may seem kind of like, well, duh, to us. But the people who were reading the gospel of Matthew, that was not a given. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Again, in Isaiah chapter 40, in verse 3, we see, or this is actually Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. I'm sorry, the PowerPoint is wrong. So this, this, again, this idea of fulfilling the Scriptures from the past, even as far as Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, you don't have to be an Old Testament scholar to remember that the tribes and the area of Zebulun and Naphtali were not high-volume places. But out of Galilee, the Savior came. And we're not going to take the time to even go through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. But there are at least 11 references to Old Testament Scripture there in those passages as well. 11 different references. All the while, Matthew reinforcing the truth. That this new kingdom, this Jesus, was not someone who denied the Old Testament. It was someone who fulfilled it. In Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases from Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, a passage that we studied just a couple of sessions ago. Jumping ahead to Matthew chapter 12 and in verse 17, this was, ful this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. 
I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. Now what's very interesting here in this passage, in Isaiah chapter 42, there was a problem amongst the Jews. They didn't like Gentiles. They didn't like foreigners. And you could understand why, if you, if you know the history. Because foreigners had caused them problems. And they had made prejudice the rule. But what they maybe had forgotten about their scriptures and what Matthew brings to the front is that this Savior, this Messiah, would even call Gentiles into His kingdom with justice and mercy and victory. A little bit later in the chapter, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, Jesus references, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. There's a direct reference to Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17. References, he is referencing his coming resurrection. And Matthew is foreshadowing this in the story. And not only does he reference Jonah chapter 1, he also references all the Son of Man passages in the book of Daniel here in this one, this one place. In Matthew chapter 13, and in verse 14, Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And later in this same chapter, in Matthew chapter 13, and verse 35, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Many people struggled with our Lord because of how He taught. He taught in parables. And sometimes this even even challenged His own disciples. But this was according to Old Testament prophecy. Jumping ahead to Matthew chapter 21 and verses 4 and 5, Matthew says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal, of a beast of burden. Now this passage from Zechariah 9 is fulfilled in our Lord's, some have called it His triumphal entry, but it's not triumphant like a king, like an amazing victor. It was triumphant because He was coming as the Messiah, but it was also triumphant because He was fulfilling a scripture right in front of them, as those with Him called Him Hosanna, cried out, Hosanna, to the son of David. In Matthew chapter 21 and in verse 42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118, again, as he is being challenged by the elite in Judaism, he references, Matthew references, and our Lord references a psalm here and says, Look, don't you remember what the scripture says? The builders are going to reject the plan. They're going to reject the foundation. They're going to reject the cornerstone. And this was the Lord's doing. In Matthew chapter 27, Matthew says, Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the acts of the sons of Israel. This is from Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. This, of course, is referring to the time when Judas betrayed our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Now, we've gone speedily through 15 examples. And we didn't even touch chapters 15 and 17 and 19 and 22 and 26. We didn't touch any of those. And the the allusions and the quotations, even in those five chapters, are numerous. In chapter 17, in dealing with the Mount of Transfiguration, where Moses and Elijah show up. In Matthew chapter 19, when he's dealing with marriage and divorce and adultery, and dealing with what the Scriptures actually taught. In chapter 22, when he is quoting Scripture to the Sadducees. And much less what we studied a few sessions ago. 
in literally one of our Lord's last breaths. Jesus cites Psalm 22, for all who had ears to hear and hearts to perceive. When he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as we studied, fully understanding that what, has, what is happening in this moment, what is happening with Jesus on the cross, is not God forsaking him. In fact, it's a cry out for understanding that any who would hear could understand and see that this was the Lord's doing. And through this suffering came the fulfillment of Psalm 22 in a way that no one ever envisioned. It's important for us to understand at a time when the fellow Jews were thinking that some of their family, friends, and neighbors had denied the faith. That's what was said about Jewish, Jewish people who became Christians. They had denied the faith. At the very least, they were unpatriotic. Or they had lost their minds. What do you mean you're dealing with Gentiles? What do you mean they're just like us? What do you mean they can be saved without circumcision? At a time when the people who were standing against Christians, along comes Matthew. Along comes Matthew with a treatise. He comes with this gospel. He comes with this sermon a very Jewish treatise on why not only have these friends of yours and family not lost their minds, but there is a good reason to believe that Jesus was and is the Messiah. And one of the main ideas in the book of Matthew is that he has fulfilled the messianic prophecies that we have been taught. And he puts all of these together. In some countings, as many as 96 different Old Testament quotations, allusions, and references. Now think about that. 96 different ones. I couldn't count that many. I probably missed some. But Matthew's gospel comes along at a time when it's important. And what's very interesting and what's very profound is that Matthew does not shy away from parts that might cause people some discomfort. He doesn't run away from the rough patches. In fact, he leans into them. He actually mentions Gentiles. He actually mentions suffering servant. Matthew's gospel is not only a brilliant defense of the first century Jews who came to believe in Jesus, but it's also a great tool in seeing the connections our Lord intended us to see 2,000 years later seeing this great tapestry of love and grace and what God wants us to see in His Word. And if we will take the time, if we will make the effort, we can see what our Lord wants us to see. We can perceive this truth and come to appreciate and understand Jesus is not only our Savior, but our Lord, and it was according to the determined counsel and will of God for the things that happened to Jesus to happen. And Jesus allowed all of this to happen to himself because he loved us. This is why we study like this. This is why we take the time to go through this. So that it will reinforce our love and appreciation of a God who thinks about us. The Old Testament scriptures ask, what is man that you are mindful of him? And through this gospel, through these prophecies, we understand what we are to God. The most precious thing ever, because the most precious price was paid so that we could be with Him. Would you bow with me as we pray? Our great and loving Father, it is impossible to thank you enough for this great picture, this great story that you have shown us in your word. Help us in our studies. Help us in our contemplation. Help us in our meditation to want to see. Help us to be humble before you and before your word and to be obedient to it and submissive to it and yield to it as a clay does to a potter. And we pray, our God, that in our studies that we would see your great love for us first and foremost. Thank you for this great love and help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate you joining us.
The other of the sessions of this study are on our web page and YouTube page, and you can access that YouTube page at veiledchurchofchrist.org. Now, Lord willing, next time we'll come to the conclusion of this particular series where we will consider specifically how our Lord fulfilled the Old Testament. The implications of that teaching might be new to some, but it's important for us to understand how the Old Testament and the New Testament fit together and how our Lord fulfilled it and brought in a new covenant for all of the world so that they all may be saved. Thank you for joining us. And please continue studying and thinking about this great story that our God has given us. A story that is true and most noble and impressive because of the great love that He has for us. Thank you.